Hello, hello. It's main course time. If you haven't seen the if you haven't seen the appetizers, my honorable mentions episodes yet, I'll post the link up above. For those of you who have who've been through the appetizers of the honorable mentions. These are my top 10 favorite episodes of Yes. I've had you wait long enough for this and I am going to give you my personal. Now, this is from me because there are no two people are going to agree on this. My personal top 10 list of episodes of Okay, I might have overdone the intro a little bit. Anyway, where are we at? Uh, start with number 10. That's always a nice place to start. Um, number 10. Huntara. Named after the clear star of this episode. Huntara was one of the good ones when I was, when I was little. I used to rent the VHS with that on it all the time. With that episode on it all the time. Um, the basic premise is that Huntara comes from the warrior race from the planet of Silax, and Hordak hires her out as a bounty hunter to take care of She-Ra. The only stipulation is that the warriors of Silax will only fight evil. So Hordak spins a mile's worth of yarn complete with false holovid videos that it's She-Ra who's the villain of this piece. Um, what? Now the scene of Huntara tracking She-Ra through the Crimson Waste was what really made this episode. Plus the Plus the scene of the two once Huntara realizes she's been tricked, so they both go to the Fright Zone to have it out with Hordak about the fact that Glimmer's been abducted. Now what what honestly tanked this episode straight down to number 10 was the actual confrontation lasted about 30 seconds. The face-to-face -face confrontation between Shira and Huntara was started and over. Again, the eight, maybe ten minutes worth of tracking her through the Crimson Waste and using all kinds of traps was was what really made this episode as great as it was. Number nine, unexpected ally. We revisit, we revisit Force Captain Adora's old horde days, this time through someone named General Sunder, who was a horde general to her, and, and who was a, a great soldier to the horde, yet we haven't seen his face until episode 45 or so. Wait a minute. Yeah, I know it was later in season one. Um, the key here is that General Sunder was also a man of honor. So he was a hordesman with a sense of honor about him. That, And he was willing to stand up to Hordak, who then showed trepidation toward him. Um... It's up to She-Ra to convince General Sunder to quit fighting for the Horde and to fight for something instead of against something. Thereby reinforcing that the Horde is against liberty and... Well, it's, 
It's always nice when Adora and or She-Ra tr tries to convince someone else to leave the Horde because of Adora's old own history with the with the Horde. So, um, why just number nine? This was the first of two of General Sundry's appearances, and the second one is is barely even worth mentioning. Um, General Sunder was a great character in this episode. It might have almost been better had he just been a one-off character. And I know that the fans really wanted to see him again, but not the way he was portrayed in Season 2. Number eight, my friend, my enemy. Hordak is in failing health and is ret and is dangerously close to fading away forever. And it's up to Shira to save him. She finally sheds tears over not not only over Hordak, but simply over a wasted life and when and if he's gone who's going to care anymore Hordak is not the leader of the Horde because he's because he's just such a likable guy anyway um, her it's her shedding of tears that ultimately saves Hordak and and we're back to the conflicts between the Rebellion and the Evil Horde. It was a great show of She-Ra's character. That's what this episode was. And it goes a little bit into into the dark dimension when the two of when she and Hordak had to work together to get out of the the Dark One's clutches. So, it's just a great show of character on she part, and it's one of the episodes that really shows that. That was number eight, my friend, my enemy. Number seven, the stone and the sword. A stone and the sword. Um... <laughs> Hordak's, Hordak's Doom Balloon um, almost destroys the Whispering Woods and only She-Ra's Sword of Protection stops it. Except, in doing so, the stone in the center of the Sword of Protection gets cracked and is ultimately damaged. Reverting She-Ra back to Adora with no way of changing back until she can repair until she can make the journey to repair the sword. Um, it's it's a slight nod to just how fragile the sword of protection was versus He-Man's power sword. And it's And you play that off against the fact that the Sword of Protection had the extra power where it could change into any weapon she needed. As opposed to He-Man's power sword that was just the catalyst for the power of Grayskull. Um, anyway, back to the stone and the sword. Adora and Cowl have to have to go on a little journey to to restore the stone in the center of the Sword of Protection and to revive She-Ra. It's always a great episode when when it's centered around Adora instead of She-Ra always saving the day. 
Howl is basically only there to, well, he's there for a few good one-liners and, well, because he is in on Adora's dual identity, so it could make sense that he's there to help her. Well, kind of coax her along. Um, anyway, Adora naturally gets through the, gets through a series of ch challenges and trials all on her own, and the Sword of Protection is restored. Well, she is back, and Etheria is all the better for it. Number six. For want of a horse. This is another one that I really look this is one that I really looked forward to anytime it came up in rotation around the time that USA had picked up the broadcast rights for for She-Ra and He-Man. Um Horde Prime has a little birthday coming up, and Hordak is without a gift for him until it's Shadow Weaver who suggests capturing Swift Wind as a gift for him. And she not only makes the suggestion, she's the catalyst who actually, actually robs she of her beloved steed. It, it's a testimony to how how needed Swiftwind really is to Shira, and it's a testament as to just how cruel Hordak could be. I mean his, I mean his speech to Swiftwind dead center in the middle of the fright zone, just before it cuts to a commercial break. Once he leaves Swiftwind in legitimate tears, is just vindictive. Cruel, nasty, and vindictive. Far more so than Hordak normally is. And it's one more reminder as to how he's the commander of the evil Horde. Then, of course, we're recovered from near tears by by rolling on the floor in laughter at the end when Hordak has lost Swiftwind has to present Horde Prime with a, with a different gift and we get to see the same old trapdoor gag in almost every other episode except this time the trapdoor is used on Hordak. Because I guess Horde Prime would have preferred a flying horse over a pair of ties. Now what what helped make this episode so special? Um, I loved the writing on this episode when I was little and um the scene between Bo and um Shadow Weaver's damsel in, in distress disguise that ultimately allowed the troopers to take Swifty in the first place. And I'd have fallen for that too. I'd have fallen for that same old trick to myself. Don't worry about it, Bo. It was a beautiful disguise Shadow Weaver picked. Anyway, <clears throat> number five, Price of Freedom. This was how cruel and cunning Hordak could sometimes be, and this was this was a huge departure from the rest of the series. In the Price of Freedom, Hordak is in the process of destroying an entire village, and He-Man and She-Ra have to stand with the villagers, and 
they can't really stop Hordak, but what they have to do is help care for the villagers. It's one of the few times that Hordak retreats in victory rather than with his t rather than with his tail between his legs. And it's and it is a catalyst for for Shira to remind He-Man about the differences between her Etheria and his Eternia. You see, one difference between Hordak's evil horde and Skeletor's evil warriors was that the horde ruled parts of Etheria. They I mean, they were an intergalactic empire who ruled several galaxies, several planets, with only the Great Rebellion to prevent them from getting a complete foothold over Etheria. And it was a concept that He-Man wouldn't, wouldn't understand. Because albeit that the original concept was that Skeletor and his evil warriors be the evil masters of the universe, that concept was left on the cutting room floor before He-Man premiered. Um, there is a touching moment that is also a glaring issue in this episode. Shira has run off to find the Great Rebellion, leaving He-Man trapped in a cavern with the villagers, with only him to hold the cavern up for them until he's hit by a freeze ray and is... Um, it's not frozen, he's injured by a freeze ray. Um, Shira arrives back just in time to help her brother to hold up an entire mountain from caving in on the villagers and she's so happy to see him that standing right there in front of the villagers she calls him Adam <laughs> and this being He-Man and She-Ra as long as someone outside of the knowledge of their dual identities is a couple of steps off screen they're also stone deaf so so it worked out just fine for them, and He-Man's secret identity is still safe. But that was basically the only issue that I found in The Price of Freedom. Which cements it in just, plain, in just the top five rather than slightly higher in the top three or something for example. Number four. Shadows and Skulls. <sighs> Honestly I always thought that Shadow Weaver was the far better villain than Hordak. And this episode proves just how conniving and manipulative she could be if she set her mind to it. We already knew that she had extremely powerful magic, well, whereas Hordak always dismissed magic for science. And by science, I mean his te the technology that allowed his arm to transform. That's basically it. Or the technology that were his horde trooper robots. Anyway. Um, I guess Shadow Weaver has failed Hordak a lot lately, and he, and he shames her over it. Um, she returns to Horror Hall and plots revenge by summoning Skeletor from Eternia to come to Etheria and help her take out Hordak. Now anyone familiar with with the rivalry between Skeletor and Hordak knows that these two parties cannot stand one another. 
I mean, Skeletor was Hordak's former apprentice, I think, which was, which again, that's pretty, it's pretty laughable when you think about it. Hordak was never, a, was never a fan of magic, so how could, how would he have apprenticed Skeletor? Anyway, Skeletor arrives on Etheria, um, takes care of Hordak for Shadow, it takes care of Hordak on behalf of Shadow Weaver. Then, being Skeletor, traps her too. For the briefest moment, Skeletor is seated on Hordak's throne, and today, She-Ra and the Great Rebellion have to help Hordak. There's a great scene of comedy between Imp and the Lesser Hordesmen in this episode. It's just... I mean, they, I mean Hordak's no longer there to cover it, to cover for Imp or to threaten the, the Hordesmen if they speak out of line against him, so... What results is them chasing him throughout the Fright Zone, and the only thing that could have made this scene better was to actually show this happening. Anyway, being an episode of Shira, Skeletor is ultimately defeated, has to go back to Eternia with his tail between his legs, and yes, Hordak and Shadow Weaver are safe. And as a, another testimony to, that, to how conniving, cunning, and manipulative Shadow Weaver is. Oh, it wasn't I, Hordak. It was someone else. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was Shadow Weaver who sent Skeletor back because he was getting ready to call her out. That's right. Shira simply kicked him off of Thordak's throne in very visible fashion. Now, it was a good episode, though. Number three, book burning. This is the prime example of how of how vindictive the evil horde really was. They took school books, books that, that told the actual history of Etheria and of the Horde, burned them, and were ready to replace them with Horde literature. They arrested a teacher and re replaced her with a Hordesman to teach her class. Thereby, um... thereby teaching their values to impressionable youth. It, it fits right up there with, with their treatment of the Ethereum people in Lost for Words or in Price of Freedom. Most of the time, the evil horde was portrayed as kind of clumsy and goofy, if evil. Sometimes the writers remembered that the Horde actually ruled a vast majority of Etheria, and that they were the evil Horde for a reason. Now, where this episode kind of failed was making Tongue Lasher the Horde teacher. Uh, might have been a little bit better to have used Catra or have Shadow Weaver disguise herself as someone else. Not Tongue Lasher, no. He was almost as laughable as Mantena or. Grizzlore. Hmm. 
It was at least rat lore was slightly more threatening than tongue lasher, but he never spoke. He rattled with his tail, so couldn't really teach anyone. Hordak himself could have could have made himself the teacher. I mean, that would have made the kids sit up and take notice. Number two, Sweet Bee's Home. Just like Season 1's Flowers for Hordak, Season 2's Sweet Bee's Home was comedy gold. I mean, it was beginning to end. Pretty much laugh a minute, and um, it was another showcase episode for Frosta. Uh, lovely Frosta. If only the gag throughout the entire episode was not that Frosto was doting over He-Man the entire time. Anyway. Um, Sweet Bee's Home is memorable. Much more memorable than anything else that Season 2 came out with. Because of the because of the romantic tension throughout the entire episode and because of the comedy that resulted. Again, it's always nice to see Frost again. Um, Sweet Bee was one of those who came along once this once this was her debut episode and then she kind of came back in Assault on the Hive but it just did not measure up to what Sweet Bee's home was as an episode. The Honorable Mentions list. I did the Honorable Mentions in last night's video. And check that out. Number one. Sword of Shira, also known as the Secret of the Sword. The five-part um, the five-part debut episode introducing Shira in in an introductory episode that E-Man never got. Now when, when the motion picture Secret of the Sword was broken up into five parts for the Sword of She-Ra, that was... They added a lot of extra footage to, to the episodes and that really helped make them a little bit better. That being said, again, She-Ra gets the introductory episode that He-Man kind of deserved. And we get to see the evolution from Force Captain Adora to Rebel Leader Adora to She-Ra, the Princess of Power. I mean... It's a great showcase episode for the main cast of the Great Rebellion. I mean, cast Spell of Frost and Mermist. They don't exist yet, as far as we know. And it is a great showcase episode for the evil, the evil horde. I mean, the fight scene in Into Etheria that introduces the mainline hordesmen was was pretty epic. I mean, and those are my top 10, 15, 10. Sword of she -Ra, Secret of the Sword is being treated as one episode top 10 episodes of she -Ra, Princess of Power. I am the vintage animation geek nerd. Vincent Animation nerd. See you soon.